And hi everyone, thanks so much for joining this evening and being here today. Super excited to speak with the Life Itself community about my master's dissertation research project um, on how collective intelligence can enhance democracy. Um, how this kind of came about, a bit of background about me, I suppose, was I switched from a decade career in sort of finance, corporates and investments, uh, dipped my toe into politics in 2021 to run for London Assembly. Um, and 2021 was quite a pivotal, really uncertain year where it was the first year out of Brexit, out of the EU, for the UK, and um, in the midst of COVID, and there was all these other social uh, marches going on around the, the kidnap of Sarah Everard and the kill the bill. So it was just a really, really uncertain time. And I just saw a complete lack of leadership in our government. I didn't feel represented. I didn't I didn't even know that there was this assembly of 25 people having lived in London for, 20, for 10 years. So I thought I just need to take a stand. Um, that led to me doing this, taking on this master's, which was a two-year part-time course. I think there's some colleagues or classmates on the call today. And um, the first time I joined a Life Itself presentation was was Mark Santini's one about contemplative citizen science and collective wisdom. And it just really, really inspired me. And yeah, I was grateful to be able to speak with him and also another interviewee on the call, Tom Atley, who's, who's an author, philosopher, activist. But we'll come to that later because, um, yeah, I managed to speak to both of them as part of my interviews it's really ex interesting and exciting to have both on the call and maybe there'll be future discussions to be had so just going back to sort of the problem I wanted to tackle in the first place and this goes back to just democracy and I, mean, I think there's a lot of people joining this call from all over the world uh US Ukraine Europe um and I guess just quick hands up does anyone believe that either the country they're in now or the country they call home is a healthy democracy. You can just put the little uh, emoji hands up if, if you believe that, and I'll just scroll through and see if I can see any, and I don't so far. So it's a problem, right? Um, <laughs> that's actually a squinting face, exactly. Um, and actually, maybe we've even forgotten what the democracy is supposed to mean. Um, you know, I won't spend too long going over all the statistics and polls about how low trust in politicians are, um, how people think votes are disproportional, the voting system is rigged, etc. cetera. Um, but what I'd like to propose is that we shift the way we view democracy towards voices, not votes. Um, so the history of elections in general, actually, elections have been around for just a few hundred years whereas democracy as a concept has been around for thousands of years. Um, and actually the whole definition of democracy towards free and fair elections was actually just post um, the UN Declaration of Human Rights in 1948 in the context of after the World War, um, where, yeah, it was down to states to try and define democracy in some sort of mandate for power for them to, I guess, retain and um, continued control over society and over so-called world peace. Um, there's a quote by Churchill, for example, he said, how, you know, how is that word democracy to be interpreted? My idea of it is that the plain, humble, common man, just the ordinary man who keeps a wife and family, he goes off to fight for his country when it's in trouble, goes to the poll at the appropriate time and puts his cross on the ballot paper, showing the candidate he wishes to be elected to parliament. That is the foundation of democracy. But is that it? So between elections, you know, which is every four or five years in some cases, how do we actually have a say in what goes on in our society, in our communities, and what's actually forcing our representatives to listen to us and respond? Um, and the problem with having an electoral democracy is that this infrequent single point of engagement can be extremely distorted by the information environment. And we've seen that with especially 2016, when it, when the Brexit referendum was about, when Trump got elected, and there was all these things about fake news, Cambridge Analytica, social media algorithms, etc. Um, so, you know, I won't delve into that in too much detail. Again, we kind of already know how much our information environment is distorted and manipulated, but it's just worth remembering and keeping that in mind because it's not going to change. And the only thing that can change is how we operate in the system. 
So there was this deliberative wave that was um, giving rise to a lot of citizen assemblies across the world, mainly in Europe, uh, more so Europe than the US and UK, to be honest. And um, the OECD had a really good deliberative um, tool bit, toolbox frame framework on how other people can set up these citizen assemblies, except COVID obviously stalled all that because people were unable to meet in person. And what is collective intelligence? Let's just hit that nail on the head before we continue is essentially collective decision making. And obviously when we have a deliberative democracy, it is moving towards collective decision making. And in the digital age, in this information society, collective intelligence is a technologically enabled way to make these collective decisions. Um, and these are kind of, you know, and actually collective intelligence, we see that in natural systems too. Um, whether that's, you know, like a group enumeration of starlings, whether that's slime mold, potentially, you know, there's a lot of examples in nature where they, and obviously mycelium networks is one, is one huge example, the biggest living organism on earth, you know, and all these natural systems are able to operate using collective intelligence. And so how come humans, if we're so-called really intelligent and complex, um, aren't able to do the same? Um, so my research actually evolved, um, as I mentioned, my master's was two years part-time. And initially when I submitted the research proposal, it was focused on this collective decision-making. And I was really you know, excited by some of the technologies I was seeing to be able to, yeah, aggregate or create consensus between hundreds, if not thousands, a very scalable amount of diverse inputs. Um, but something that happened in between that time, of course, is the release of ChatGPT and LLMs. And as you know, ChatGPT was one of the fastest ever adoption of newly released technology. I think it had so 100 million signups in two months. I don't know how many of us here use it on a frequent daily basis, or at least have tried it. I'm sure most people have. Um, and the advancement of this sort of AI and LLM technology is just advancing at a scale that we cannot ignore. But what are the implications of that? So some of the studies I've seen, and as you can see, the dates of these, and that's why my deadline is on Friday, but a lot of these papers were coming out June, July, August. That's that's the speed at which the technology has been released and it's already been incorporated in these studies um, around, yeah, how can we use them in these collective decision-making, um, in these deliberation environments? And what I was noticing was that a lot of them would, say use the word empower you know empower the public uh empowered agents here on this this um study where they actually try to simulate an entire social network that we can revisit that later on um you know for so for example polis uh i don't know if anyone's heard of this uh tool before this platform um i'll feature it on, on the next slide but it actually came out in Taiwan back in 2014 as part of the Sunflower Revolution, and it's been used in their sort of V Taiwan digital democracy for many years, ever since its first successful sort of release. And it's been used to decide on policy from, from Uber to alcohol sales amongst, amongst the um, people of, of Taiwan. Um, but one of the co-founders, uh, for example, this, late, this later study is by one of the Polis co-founders, and now they are backing up the polis platform which is a very kind of simplistic open source technology with llms and obviously the features are just exponential um but then what i was seeing was that actually it was maybe going too far ahead and losing the agency of the human participant in the sense that you know we can start simulating predicting recommending vote prediction um and just you know some of the features of some of these studies I saw you know there were some time limits on people's input and actually they'd be excluded if they um you know didn't contribute in time there weren't any external sources given to participants um to increase their knowledge meanwhile the machine or the AI was being trained and being fed external in information to to learn so that's another point around sort of human versus machine learning and, you know, one quote in the study, for example, that says, you know, they were asking LLMs to explain themselves, which proved valuable for improving their results and understanding their behavior. 
And, you know, this is just kind of the direction that technology is going in or how people are advancing AI is that this sort of these features of introspection, learning and understanding is emphasized for the benefit of the machine rather than the human. Um, so this slide just kind of, you know, going back to the magic of coming together as humans, as people, um, you know, back in the back in the day, there were these world cafes. I don't know if they still exist, but I think you, Tom, who's on this call, you raised my attention to, to these. And, you know, there's things like empathy tents, apologies for the uh, slightly grainy image. I mean, maybe because it's so old that people don't do it anymore. But, you know, how great would it be if these were set up around town, you know? Um, the People Speak is a very local to me in East London. Um, I don't know if, if Mikey's on the call, but they featured in, in my research as well. And I mean, we all know, right, what it feels like to be in the presence um, of others in real life. Um, so it's just that contrast of like where the studies of LLM driven deliberative technologies is going, which is sort of further and further, or I see it to be further and further away from the human participant. And then just holding that in parallel to what we know is the is the real magical effects of being in the presence of, of others. So yeah, this is a bit of a journey. I was trying to find a photo of maybe me during the politics campaign, but I just looked really stressed, pale, and and so, so I thought I'd just include one from Bali. And because I managed to do the last two terms of my master's remotely out there. And actually I saw so many things to do with community practices. Um, you know, which is lacking uh, in, in London, in East London. So that, there was actually a lot to learn from, from Southeast Asia, which I'd love to bring back here. Um, so how my research kind of narrowed down, having seen all these things happening and happening quite quickly and happening right now, um, and focusing in on this concept of empowerment. Um, and obviously, Considering my journey, having run for the London Assembly because I wanted to take a stand for the, for the people, I didn't feel like we had any say or any power. Then I'm seeing these studies driven by, you know, advancements in, in AI where they are saying they're empowering people, but actually in reality, it looks like they're empowering the machine over the humans. I really wanted to focus in on what does this actually mean and how can we, yeah, how can we imp increase either empowerment or just the feeling of, of empowerment. Um, and I focus in on this, this uh, yeah, phenomena of, of epistemic growth, which basically means knowledge gains. Um, and I split knowledge between explicit and intrinsic or implicit. And that's essentially the difference between, yeah, knowledge that we can see factually represented around us or that we gain. And then there's implicit knowledge, which we might not consciously be fully aware of, but we know it to be so from experience, um, maybe subconscious bias, and implicit knowledge can be induced into, into explicit knowledge through certain practices. So yeah, maybe that's contemplation, reflection, et cetera. Um, and how I set about my research was, I created this Substack page, I shared that on the Life Itself group as well, so thanks everyone who had a go at that. Um, and it might not have seemed clear like how this whole conversation, because I set up the conversation around generative AI, which is obviously relevant, maybe a bit ironic. And what I wanted to try and design was a conversation generating collective intelligence, but actually where with the human in mind every step of the way. So throughout the 10 stages, and I don't know if this link will work now, but um, throughout the 10 stages, kind of, you know, going through various sort of learning materials, um, being able to go onto this polis platform and this is a snapshot just this evening of where the consensus has has, has gone um amongst all the statements but then yeah just making sure that when the participants going through this exercise before submitting their statements and voting on certain views or submitting their own views they are as informed as possible i put some meditation videos in there as well so there is the opportunity to reflect and kind of think or question why they hold something to be true um and yeah and then obviously I'm actually less interested in what the outcomes of this polis platform is because I'm obviously focusing on the human experience and whether they felt like they learned anything whether um interest increased and this this feeling of empowerment basically without actually explicitly calling it that because I'm exploring 
um yeah what could what could drive that so the other aspects of the research was creating this chatbot um in lieu of an in-person human facilitator there's this um sort of relational theory called imago relational relation theory which is actually already started to be uh, practiced on European politicians, which include features such as mirroring and um, validation. So kind of, again, ironically, using generative AI and ChatGPT to create these feelings of, of to, well, to create the features of mirroring and validation. Um, I set up this, this chatbot at one of the final stages of the exercise where, you know, people who are participating remotely or fully online, they can put in their statement and then this response will come up saying, I'm hearing you're expressing this. Have I understood you correctly? Um, you know, and there are actually studies to show, even though I know it sounds like that movie Her maybe, but there have been studies of like mental health chatbots that work, you know, very well uh, with, with people that, you know, talk to these, yeah, talk to these chatbots and actually still feel uh, some sort of bond or some sort of empathy or just feel understood and listened to. So there is real opportunity there for, maybe for chatbots just to create that sense of feeling heard and listened to um yeah in lieu of the human facilitator and in lieu of you know as we know probably very over overstretched counselors or mental health therapists um at the moment so there was this chatbot feature and i also went to a couple of events so there was this regents unite um conference or gathering as they like to call it with a lot of sort of environmentalists uh, but then crypto people so I did a hybrid conversation there where I went through the same Substack conversation, but we all did it together in person and we still submitted the statements onto Collis, but we were still able to chat in the room. And then the third final end of the spectrum model was this people speak um, on, the, on the bottom right, which was fully in person, no polis statements, just a pure, fully in-person conversation. Um, and then at the end, I sort of surveyed how each the how all the participants in these three different um, models of dialogue, so either fully online, hybrid, and fully in person, sort of felt about the experience. Then I also carried out some interviews, which we'll come to later. Um, so the results of the um, of the conversation between these three three different variations are as follows. Um, so I mean, the first question I asked in the survey is, "How do you feel?" in in three in three words and it's quite interesting to just maybe see how the fully online group did include some some more negative um feelings you know whether that was anxious afraid concerned overwhelmed uh and that was completely absent from the hybrid or in-person ones so that kind of maybe indicates that when people are in the presence of people we feel more comfortable more warm engaged um and the other results about yeah, we had, I tried to test for full expression or full inclusion, as in on a scale of one to 10, how much did you feel that you were f fully able to express everything you wanted to say? And how much did you feel that you were um, heard? And as we can see, the in-person kind of trumps that. But then when we get to increased interest, um, the online group does better, maybe because again, there's maybe more materials and you're just able to go through it in your own time. Uh, the improved understanding was better in hybrid, so whether you're in so a bit of mix between in person and online, maybe because you're able to discuss um, and get questions and response back better, and you, there's a this collective learning going on. Maybe that's why that um, result came about. And we also asked whether they gain more perspectives from others um, and understood others' perspectives more. And we can see, in terms of understanding others' perspectives. And even though I got a lot more responses on the fully online group, uh, just by nature of it obviously being easier to participate in, that went down right down to 31%. Um, and I guess that's obviously because in, in reality, there's no, there was no one else there to kind of tell stories, even though I did specifically try to include some YouTube videos of people who, you know, were concerned or suffered about the generative AI issue in terms of, you know, um, artists, copyright, etc. And that was true. So I did try to create some sort of storytelling or feelings of empathy, but it still didn't really go through, meaning that really in, in person has a much more greater effect of, you know, understanding others' perspectives. Um, and then, so this was all around 
epistemic growth. So that's about, yeah, epistemic growth, empathy. Have you understood more about the topic? Have you understood other people's perspectives on the topic? Um, and we all know that, well, it's proven in some other sort of citizen assembly studies that, you know, hearing other people's stories does have the power or ability to change your own view as well through that empathy piece. Um, you know, for example, in the Irish assembly around same-sex marriage, there was a guy that, you know, upon listening to the story of of someone who was gay, he changed his firmly held, previously homophobic views um, that he'd held his whole life up to that point, you know? So that's the power of really coming together and, and kind of listening to each other. Um, so that's all the epistemic growth part. And then the empowerment piece was kind of asking through, yeah, the interest to participate in the citizen assembly going forward. Um, and also the in increased interest um, aspect, because that kind of means, okay, you feel that you know a bit more about the topic and you want to actually maybe take further action or you want to, you're interested to learn more and do more about it. Um, and actually, the again, the interest to participate in a specific assembly going forward was actually fully, uh, yeah, there was more full votes for that in the hybrid and in-person um, results. And but then actually the trust to, to, of the outcome of citizen assembly to trust the outcome of that more than an elected representative was um, higher in the in the online group, meaning meaning that yeah, even though you're participating fully online, um, you kind of feel that actually when you're given with all the information or as much information um, and you're going through this exercise, that actually yeah, you trust other people to make that decision more than. Um, the elected representative and yeah in terms of deliberation quality decreasing online everyone kind of thought the same but it's not too bad they're just kind of on the fence about um about this but again i think technology has the ability to to really enhance this if we design it and and intend it to be it, to do so in the right way um so yeah the interviews were the super interesting piece of it i'm still it took a while to transcribe everything because they were few hours long and I had a really good um, just kind of range of perspectives from all around the table of the debate. Um, so in alphabetical order, we had we had Ben from the Sortition Foundation, Mark from Learning Planet Institute, Northeast University and Life Itself, um, Mikey, who's from the People Speaks facilitator, and and Tom, who's also on this call from the Co-Intelligence Institute, um, and anonymized a guy from a big tech, big tech firm who I've just use with the little picture there but so we all know mark tom is in the in the top middle ben is in the bottom left and mikey is in the in the bottom center and just trying to kind of analyze the outcomes of this and i didn't use ai to create this but i'm sure that, again there's a tool out there maybe it's not free I'm trying to thematically group everything that came out of these conversations but for the purpose of this call i'll just maybe discuss a couple so the first theme uh, is we see or that I, that I saw emerging was just talk around the collective and not the individual. Um, and it's just really interesting, again, like just how varied everyone, everyone's backgrounds and, and work is, we all end up kind of, kind of coming to the, some you know similar understandings or um, just knowledge of what we know to be there what, and what exists. So for example, in terms of you know the collective, not the individual, you know, it's inter interdependency, not independence. Um, and then how you know we talked a lot about systems change, and actually, you know, Tom raised the perspective that we should um, you know, talk about it as a whole. Uh, it's not just individuals, and actually, the whole system is the starting place. You have to deal with the whole system. That's the unit that you're working with, and the people are in it that become a significant piece of that. Um, and then, you know, Mark, and then that kind of links slightly to that whole metamodern piece that Mark brought about describing how, you know, pre-modern was very subjective, modern is overly objective and deconstructing, then metamodern is a meta posture where, you know, you're constructing a story and I'm, I'm presuming maybe that's collectively, you know, oscillating between objective and subjectives, but we do that together. Um, and then there was also you know, Ben raised the issue that there is also the risk that if we focus on empowerment, um, individuals can actually risk prioritizing their own empowerment over the collective, which will be the counter effect of these things. So again, it just seems a lot more moving towards the collective and the whole 
and um, even in organizational development, there's this getting the whole system in the room and Indigenous Council was noted to talk until there's nothing left but the obvious truth. So if all players in the room are, all, if all players of in the room when this happens of the system, and if this links to sort of synchronicity and like, yeah, engaging um, in sync, then the system will change automatically. And that kind of relates to how Mark said that, yeah, I doubt the ability of asynchronous methods based on the historical needs of early nation states and the need for an institutional religion that allowed for the synchronization processes like rituals to achieve a wiser state. So, you know, as we are becoming less religious, there's maybe less reason or, you know, to gather as a community, but maybe we can think of other reasons or practices um, for us to sort of congregate and, and get together and just kind of get these sort of ritual practices back in place um, systemically so we can act, act as a whole. Just a little um, slide here on that point, you know, so communities and indigenous cultures, there's, um, so this top right corner, you know, this is just an example how, you know, in Bali, and they've got their own sort of hybrid religion, obviously Bali is just one of the thousands of islands of Indonesia, but they have this sort of mix between Buddhism and Hinduism and their own sort of religious practice, but the amount of ceremonies and gatherings I saw, you know, every week, every week almost, and you'd get people from all over the village, old and young. Um, if you have expats communities, there'd be, uh, yeah, like the foreign families and children joining in as well. It was really, and yeah, I mean, it's just it's just a reason to get together. And I think in sort of, sort of modern day society, all people have lost that. Um, but then I guess that's why we are seeing a rise in these sort of co-living, conscious co-living um, communities now. So, and I really love this quote from Oxwell that collective intelligence facilitators are the new priests. But then also when we, you know, want to refer to indigenous cultures or, or borrow from, from their wisdom, it's it's be careful not to commoditize it. And I think that was a point from Tom because, and, and this is a photo from Medicine Festival who kind of pride themselves or market themselves on having um, indigenous people fly over from either Brazil or, you know, wherever to attend the festival. Um, but again, you know, how much is that genuinely respecting the culture versus, you know, just using it for marketing purposes. Um, and the second interview theme was around this culture of dialogue. And actually the what was emerging was actually the opposite of dialogue or speaking at all. And actually we were, I ended up finding a lot of similarities amongst the different interviewees about making space for silence, for, for waiting, um, actually for asking questions, uh, active listening, introspection. Um, and yeah, so we can see here that some quotes around and then obviously relating this to, to meditation and how that allows for you to be an active witness, removing layers of performance and being in the face of contemplation of yourself. So that real like introspection and awareness of, you know, wh where is this coming from? Like, you know, if I have a strongly held opinion or a belief about something, where's that coming from, you know? Um, and actually stripping down all those layers to the core. And I wonder if if that core is is quite universal amongst us. Um, again, lending from organization theory, and you know this I relate to this so much as well with my background, but you know Ben said, in organizations, the first thing a good leader would do is actually ask people for their opinion, you know, not to say, I know what to do, but actually bring people on board, you know, this whole stakeholder piece, active listening. And this contrast to politicians that usually go on and saying, you know, I'm going to do this, discounting the functional reality, but there shouldn't be a disconnect between the way, that people see leadership in politics and in the wider world. And that's exactly, I completely agree with that. And yeah, it shouldn't be one rule for them and another for us or another for the you know, rest of society or how organizations work. And another point, you know, in politics, you're always listening to something that makes you react immediately. So from the citizen's perspective, you know, the way that we consume media and a lot of, a lot of politics news, especially in the UK uh, is always very, I mean, it's just it's just behavior that you wouldn't see anywhere else uh, in society. And yeah, practicing introspection tries to help you slow down and, and give you time for, as the observer to see patterns, projections and sit with that so you don't react, but respond with contemplative activism. And there's an interesting piece around, you know, the Quaker culture talking about discernment. Um, as Tom mentioned, that 
waiting on clarity and cognitive processes of the Quaker waiting on the light, which is um very different to, you know, trying to solve problems, move fast and break things or doing solving problems with personal benefit. And it's actually a form of systems thinking, potentially. And when we talk about your epistemic growth, let's contrast that to this epistemic humility um, and welcoming the voice of the other. So, I mean, you saw that mind map, there's literally so much more themes that come out of that, but I'll, I'll do the full write up in the next 24 hours. But, you know, why are these themes or why is the culture of dialogue especially important in the age of AI? And um, if we have to think about that, it's because, yeah, we, you know, as humans, we need to retain agency of our voice and you know when we're using ChatGPT to generate content for us um and it and it can be used for images for sound and i've had i even know people who used use it to write speeches for like you know their friend's wedding and yeah if we start delegating more and more we already delegate a lot of our functions to technology um we are really just unconsciously handing everything over to, to the AI. So, and there's a quote from an MP in another study, we know, relating this, this culture of dialogue, which we don't see a good example of in politics. So the quote is, you know, our parliaments are not deliberative bodies. They are conceived for politics as a zero sum game where one party's win is another's loss. And what you typically get is debate and conflict rather than solution finding in the common interests. So we need to drastically change the way we decide our future if, you, if we want it to be a fair one. So, yeah, this whole culture of dialogue, you know, rather than trying to change the existing broken system in politics, we can just, you know, I think just do it ourselves. And um, this is kind of the movement I'm I'm more for. Um, yeah, systems change rather than a lot of these campaigns where it's, you know, try to um, sign up, register to vote or your vote matters. And I've come to believe that it doesn't really. So I think if we between us can figure it out ourselves. Um, it would be much more so-called empowered. Um, so these human-centered elements of democrat democratic deliberation um, have arisen, and this is the sort of ongoing question that I'd like to sort of discuss or explore further is, yeah, how can any of these features be replicated online? And I guess the investigations I did across the three different modes of collective intelligence conversation, it shows there are still there's still a lot to be learned in a fully online um in a fully online deliberation or dialogue but focusing on these sort of human centered elements should be the key starting point whereas the tech first as opposed to the tech first starting point that i saw with other studies and that's where yeah they're training and learning the ai or the machine ahead of the humans um so Yeah, and I think because yeah, again, at the end of the day, deliberation is a better form of decision making than 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 single input voting. Um, so yeah, I'd like to just maybe, maybe take a pause here and and this concept of empowerment. You know, what what does that mean to you? And does anyone have any thoughts or ideas, or or initial responses or reactions when they hear that term? I mean, maybe that term isn't appealing to to some people, but um, presuming that it is or it is something to sort of strive for in in a democracy for people to feel empowered in a democracy um yeah what does that actually mean and I think it is important to have a think about this because I didn't see across the study so far a sort of accepted definition to be honest um, but yeah so what does empowerment mean to you maybe you can just put some words in the chat thank you Bella yeah if everyone wants to um Try and use the raise hand tool at the at the bottom of the page, and then we can kind of go through if uh, people wish to share. Um, yeah, no, thank you so much for presenting, and definitely some interesting themes. And curious to kind of dive into the discussion a bit more about this. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, this slide just quickly goes through how is a shift in some of the key words potentially. So yeah, public spheres from political theory and maybe that's shifting into collective intelligence. But when we talk about judging, we can move this to presencing from reaction to reflection. When we talk about equanimity of the mind, that's actually somewhat similar to consensus in decision-making because it's 
lack of active objection and the sort of just sitting or the balance aspect of it echo chamber to resonance chamber so yeah it's all just like shifting paradigm basically and how and how we see how and how we see things um and yeah this kind of we can end on this slide before the, yeah open up the discussion and i just kind of thought about this um this concept of yeah when we when we go in, when we go inside actually and go deeper into the silence there's an in contemplation and, and introspection etc we just realize that we are all part of the same source um and the same sort of tree of life and actually from the outside if we're just these different leaves maybe looking at another leaf far far away higher up wrinkled close to the sun we think oh they're completely different to us but actually we're all connected to the same source um so yeah just moving in that direction is is what i'm trying to do so yeah any any comments or questions or clarifications um let me know i think there's yeah a lot of concepts covered there but and it's a lot to tackle but hopefully um hopefully some food for thought christopher do you want to share a bit more about what you hi bella oh i hi. had a question hey hi Lee. <laughs> um thank you for your talk um i had um several questions maybe i can go the, with the first one um i had a more maybe practical question um, regarding the dialogues right um how you do you envision uh the embodiment of that because indeed when you talked about the need of dialogues the need of presence instead of judging right and accepting yep. discussions yeah uh, there are many various ways and some people right already understand the limitations of citizens assemblies as well yep. um that so would what are your thoughts about that yeah no, thanks. thanks so much for that question yeah absolutely um i think yeah embodiment is hugely important and this came up in some of the interviews as well that obviously so far as far as we know ai is ai is not embodied at the moment and a lot of the mm -hmm. stuff tends to be cognitively focused rather than um in the body and this whole duality piece and you know one thing that sprung to mind when you asked that question is potentially if we were to continue moving towards more online participation uh and again it's about using technology to enable or enhance our experience you know it's not just phones and, and laptops and apps like we do have these vr headsets i have seen one step further of that where people have these sort of like joysticks or something on their hands and things like that so that can help the physical engagement but i don't think so far as i've seen and this is interesting to ask others if they've or what others think but i don't think again that technology hasn't necessarily been designed to participate in a connective way with others or other players or other you know participants it's more just how you know you in this virtual reality environment for gaming etc but maybe there is something there to yeah create this um environment and your body responds because you think you're in this in this room in this forum you know maybe we could have a vr set up in a park you know this like sunny park looking at the tree and we all just gather in this park to have a debate when actually in reality we're in uk us europe um yeah and there's a comment here about mm -hmm. empowerment for me is about being provided with knowledge and tools yeah thanks so much Jess ryan i mean so this i would move on to a different question now but um th does that answer your question sorry Liu, about embodiment um, I, think... I asked more i asked more about formats though not about yeah. technologies per se sure. about formats if you if you okay. have some alternative to citizens assemblies for uh, formats or facilitation um, because like the people to speak them talk or like all these initiatives yeah. for example they experience right yeah. that whenever you experiment experiment with that with the social technology mm -hmm. then it actually can uh maybe have a, give you an idea for other um possible formats maybe yeah i mean for sure. I mean, there's all these like relational embodiment workshops. This came up a lot in interviews too. I'll send some links in a bit, but you know, these, these do go on, but again, whether those, 
like much more in person, much more yes, embodied and connective and you know physically in close proximity with each other. But those forums or are uh, they're not necessarily with the objective of collective decision making. Does that make sense? That's probably more for mm. right. So so yes, that does exist, but uh, at the moment there hasn't really been um the objective to, to tie those practices with mm-hmm. with democratic decision making, etc. Because yeah. again, it's all been about yeah. Yeah. Um thanks. Yeah, thanks. But I'll send you Thank a link you. of relation and mm-hmm. embodiment separately. Um and then, yeah, thanks for the input about empowerment, about from Jess Ryan saying that yes, it mm. providing with the knowledge and tools to make an informed decision and engage in action with autonomy. I mean, yeah, that's basically paraphrasing the only definition of empowerment that I could find, which was by the OECD. So yes, it's about increased political capacity and how if you feel enabled or yes, with the right tools equipped, et cetera, to actually then take action in your own hands. Mm -hmm. Yes, thanks for that. Um, Thank you. And Woody, did you say something? Did you have your hand up? Yeah. Yeah, I did. Um, Thanks for patience. Yeah, no, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I really uh, enjoyed your presentation. Um, uh, I was wondering about um, how, uh, yeah, I guess the process for like, I don't know, getting, keep, getting, I guess, the right, I and mean, I guess, ideally a representative, like, you know, sample of people into these different spaces. Um, I know, I mean, there's just an issue um, in terms of housing, how, you know, a, a lot of the reasons in you know, high cost cities that house enough not enough housing has been built is that, you know, only the most vocal people uh, who already live there and, you know, are often, you know, land, uh, you know, uh, property owners show up and then, I don't know, they, they scream at the elected officials about potentially having a big apartment building coming up uh, near, near them. And so, I mean, there's, you know, uh, there's concerns about, you know, you only amplify some of the loudest voices and you, slow down this like the effectiveness of you know governments to you know achieve certain outcomes um by you know requiring I know community meetings about you know a lot of different changes um and yeah I, I'm curious about with AI potentially you know being able to create lots more options for entertainment in a lot of other spheres of life um what ideas there are to actually encourage, you know, a more representative sample of people to come, you know, into these spaces, um, whether it's, I don't know, compensating them some for their time or I don't know about how you time the, the, the meeting. Um, yeah, I'm wondering absolutely. about uh, your thoughts on that. Yeah, no, thanks so much for that question. And absolutely, I think, you know, the loudest voices in the room, people speaking over one another, et cetera, though, those aspects of in-person deliberation tends to be you know sort of equalized or or sold for with technology actually um but then in terms of representation you know yes that is one thing that there were great efforts to to do that in person for the citizen assemblies in in person in real life uh, through sortition um so ben one of the interviewees is part of the sortition foundation and yes they do a lot of work around that and yes they do tend to be remunerated um to avoid you know that's whole self-selection bias like you say where it's people who mostly invest in the issues show up so but that sortition process from what ben said even though they'll send out thousands thousand invites and they've you know tried to really calculate how to get a representative population the response rate is still around five percent so super super low um and then with these ai studies where they have had human participants um again yeah they would have been remunerated for their time um and again these are just these are you know, experiments, they're not actually recruitments for for real deliberations, for, for real um, issues and outcomes. But for even for these um, AI experiments, yeah, they'll be remunerated, but then they're not actually coming out of it any sort of, you know, wiser or learning. That's almost, that's why I think what I saw was that it was quite extractive. And I see the technology being developed in a very extractive rather than enhancing or empowering way for people because people would go in there and it's almost like they're being used to train the AI models um but I think the representation piece in general that and that came out a lot in the surveys with the questions where you know I asked participants uh of these of these different models I set up uh would you trust the citizens assembly um more than your representative representative and a lot of the comments would say I wouldn't trust a citizens assembly because I don't think 
it's fully representative or unless you know things like that but then when we talk when we talk about representation i think we've just got to compare with what we've got right now and you know there is a lot of studies to say or if you just maybe reflect you know for, for oneself if i knew that my local community and that people speak for example there were so many different people around that table you know there was a there was a transgender person there was mother there was babe there was everyone you know and if the if that group of people came up with a solution to save housing in my local community i would trust them more than i don't even know who's the local councillor to be honest with you of my constituency and you know so i think we've just got to compare it to the current situation and just if it's a little bit better it's just a step in the right direction um hey thank you yeah thanks for doing um <laughs> i've got a few comments in the chat yeah yeah so citizen assemblies need to be well facilitated and yeah compared to most national politicians in the u.s who are white male millionaires or zombies i don't know I'd like to say a bit about like um empowerment as well. Um, yeah, I definitely hear like empowerment is like having the tools and resources to really maybe understand and engage in a topic. Um, personally, I feel most empowered when I'm engaged in topics that are relevant to me and my skills, rather yeah. than being engaged in everything. Yeah. So I kind of get a sense that um, you know, the idea of enhancing democracy is allowing more people to engage with more topics. Um, and in that sense, I actually, you know, maybe there's a possibility that AI is able to enhance that as well by providing the extra knowledge. Like for me personally, to mm. understand and engage in certain topics, which I do not have the knowledge or the understanding of, would be very difficult. And so to have lots of people with little knowledge about a certain topic engaging in and voting on in a very specific way yeah would not necessarily be valuable for society as a whole no completely agreed and um yes and, and to that point and yeah so if I didn't make it clear but I guess that's why I was focusing on that epistemic growth bit because you know when we talk about collective decision making in this assembly how are these how are participants well informed or have the resource available and yes ChatGPT or AI can really help with that learning process actually obviously yeah we adults or anyone, we've all got different ways of learning and that's you know well beyond the scope of the study, but that is definitely something I think AI and technology can help with. So yeah, that whole learning piece, that so-called epistemic growth piece before we make those decisions. And if we know that that learning phase has been effectively carried out ahead of the collective decision-making, then maybe we can trust the outcomes a bit more. And again, compared to how decisions are being made say in parliament right now in the uk for example and it's it is still about you know voting on bills and you've got this diametric they're not sitting around a circle in parliament right they're well in the uk they're opposite each other shouting at each other and it, you know again it's just it's the, the issue is so bad that we can't get to the ideal stage straight away we just have to start making steps and you know as as a society or as citizens like how can we just set a good example um ourselves and this the technology or this this sort of like debate around the collective intelligence decision making and in human-centered design uh for these discussions don't just necessarily have to be applied for uh political national state you know decisions you know as we're talking more about these uh you know conscious co-living spaces and communities as we're setting these communities up and as these communities are growing how are we making decisions within these communities we all need, yeah, collective decision-making approaches. So this can really be applied and a step towards that. And that's also a form of taking matters to our own hands. Um, oh, we've got another a quick comment in the chat from Tom. So the whole issue with empowerment comes up in our embattled majority and culture when we need to be moving towards consensus. Yes, regenerativity and reciprocity, which is the whole other paradigm where power shifts from power with to power with yeah so when power shifts from power over to power with power from within and power from among and that's yeah i think it's really interesting this yeah that power from within and then comparing that to obviously the contemplative citizen science um work of, of mark uh, and his team so yeah and how yeah how ai can serve that is a totally different question but exactly and i try to do these like yeah 
mirroring or validation chatbots or uh, it's first step but again it's it's a very thin line with with sort of with agency uh matthew did you have your hand up thanks uh yeah i just wanted to say one thing the thing that kind of resonated with me with this talk the most i think um is that i feel like a lot of these conversations like necessarily deal with problem solving and it's like what problems are being solved like whether it's a community whether it's a, a nation and i think it, probably most of them have to do with like resource distribution but i feel like uh problem solving is is an important way to kind of contextualize these conversations which i think like really 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 need to happen because like it's not it's not a good problem solving mechanism or it's not a good problem solving uh you know system that we have like the problems that we are solving and like how we're solving them so i think especially when like talking about democratic processes and like including voices i think a huge part is like what problem is being solved whether it's like on a community level and how we're solving that problem i think i think okay. for me that kind of stuck out the most but i really i really appreciate this talk a lot there's one um Maybe I'll just throw a quick resource in here. There's this one organization called, I think it's called New Public, but they're, and I think they're USA based and they kind of focus on like enhancing public discourse a lot. And I think mm -hmm. that'd be a good organization to reach out to. Yeah, I'll, I'll look them up, thanks so much. But yeah, no, that's a good point, right? The decision-making doesn't just have to be about problem solving. Resource distribution is a key one as well. And as we're moving more towards, yeah, self-sufficiency, et cetera, um, that's a really good point. Well, I think, hold on, maybe I could just I mean, no, yeah, yeah, but there's other ways. Like resource, I meant resource distribution as a problem in itself or oh, other, yeah, of course. like what are, what are the problems that any political system aims to to solve or kind of mm. give it? And I, I, the common pool resources. I, yeah, I guess so, yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah, thanks. Let me look up New Public as well. So we are coming near to time and... Um... Yeah, before we close, if there are any other kind of comments that people want to share, feel free in the meantime. Um, I also wanted to share that um, next month in October, we're actually having a month around uh, value-based conversations, uh, which I think is quite pertinent, and particularly around this research and us coming together and having conversations about kind of like problem solving, but also coming from our values and, and sharing about and knowing our values and sharing from them. Um, so next month will be kind of, yeah, quite exciting. We're gonna be having like uh, weekly Zoom calls of breakout rooms where we'll be discussing about different values with people that we don't necessarily know, um, which I think will be very valuable. <laughs> um, mm. Yeah. And Sorry. also, on Monday next week, we are having a screening of The Great Turning by Joanna Macy. Uh, it came up recently in the WhatsApp chat, um, particularly around kind of sentiment and narratives around climate change and like, how do we, like what narrative is most useful for us moving forward as we kind of approach these these huge problems. Um, so yeah, that's on Monday. I will share it in the WhatsApp chat. Um, and also here, Lauren, do you have the link or should I just go and find that quickly? You're on it. Thank you. And... I'm just, yeah, I'm just trying to find it. So I'll send it to you. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, Christopher, go ahead. Um, uh, yeah, I, I mean, just on this sort of subject of, um, uh, of, uh, values, um, I, I mean, my, my experience of people uh, arriving in a kind of conscious community is there's a very substantial kind of period of adaptation where like previously the in kind of normal society there is a sort of uh, a kind of range of emotional authenticity that's just not permitted or allowed or, or just kind of paid attention to. Uh, and um, yeah, it can be um, quite uh, a, a change for people to adapt to that their, their feelings are actually important and it's actually valid to kind of express your, your feelings. And um, 
Yeah, I, I, I mean, in, in a lot of this talk, we've been talking about kind of problem solving. And um, yeah, I, I, I don't know if you're familiar with convergent facilitation. Um, which is a little bit kind of inspired by um, nonviolent communication in a way. And um, nonviolent communication has this kind of idea that um, uh, we have needs, like the things we actually need, like to be heard, to, to be seen, you know, to feel safe or whatever. And um, uh, and strategies, um, and you know, our, our strategies like you no, know, we 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 you know, we can't possibly, um, I don't know, go to the park today. You know, it's too dangerous or, or whatever. Um, uh, and it has this kind of idea that um, strategies can conflict, but but their actual underlying needs uh, are much less conflictual. And uh, convergent facilitation kind of takes this sort of um, inspiration of um, trying to kind of refine people's um, needs to non-conflicting essences. Anyway, my my point is that um, you know if if you if everyone has kind of equal power and rank and the same information, then actually converging on decision decision is I'm not going to say it's easy, but it's 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 not necessarily difficult. Uh, and that, in my experience, a lot of the difficulty happens when um, you know, for example, people are holding on very tight to a particular strategy about what they think should happen, and they're not very conscious of what the actual underlying emotions or needs are about that. And I, I, I think this is kind of something that's kind of happening in the sort of polarization that we're kind of seeing in society that uh, people are, um, uh, you, you know, fighting for segregated washrooms without really understanding the, the, the kind of emotional landscape that, that kind of underpins that. Uh, and so, yeah, part of the, you know, First steps are emotional literacy, you know, and being able to listen and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, and and anyway, so I I I kind of won't go into it sort of too too deeply. But the thing I'm kind of really interested in is okay, well, on a mass scale, how do we develop people's emotional literacy? You know, their ability to kind of understand themselves, um, uh, and uh, yeah, I, I guess much less than kind of AI tools. I'm, I'm kind of quite interested in techniques like acceptance commitment therapy about developing emotional or psychological flexibility. This, this this kind of stuff. And yeah, I don't I don't necessarily see AI as a kind of path to doing that. But there there are some apps that are trying to you know do this kind of stuff. Like 29K has as a whole uh is a platform for, for kind of developing uh yeah all, all of these kind of personal internal skills to understand each other yeah anyway so th that was the basically it that I, I i see a big kind of impediment to um making decisions collectively on a large scale is is the um the sort of level of personal development that uh, people have. Hmm. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for sharing. And yeah, I hope you'll come to the the values conversations next month because I think that's also a step towards that. Although maybe from a more kind of like, um, I don't know. I kind of want to say, foundational approach, as in like there's no particular technique to it except to speak of values and hope that that opens up the space within ourselves to kind of enhance our own emotional literacy. But yeah, let's see.